welcome to the very first episode of the BPD Bunch talk show. We have a panel of people who are in functional recovery from borderline personality disorder. And each week, a few of us are going to get together to discuss BPD related topics to help give you insights into the different ways BPD can be expressed in someone's life. We'll also cover the different paths we followed on our recovery journeys to give you hope and direction for your own. For our first season, we'll talk about each of the nine BPD symptoms, our experiences with them, and what's helped us to overcome them. I'm your host, Zanny, and today I'm here with Alex, Jess, Lore, and Andre. So how's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Excited. Yeah, we're doing great. It's a beautiful day. Yay, where is everybody coming from today? So I'm in Southampton, uh, Southampton, United Kingdom. This is down in the south, about an hour and a half from London. I'm uh, coming from you guys from California, so the West Coast. It's a really hot day here. I'm from New Jersey, but today I'm coming at you from upstate New York. I just moved from New York, actually, um, and I'm up in Canada. I'm in Toronto. And I'm in New Mexico. Not Mexico, New Mexico. <laughs> Still in the U.S. All right, so today we're going to talk about the first BPD symptom in the DSM-5, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. So I don't know about y'all, but personally, this symptom expressed itself differently at different times. When I was in high school, I had a really hard time with romantic relationships. I think I was just terrified to ever be in a position where someone might reject me so I refused to make the first move and I would like inadvertently avoid people just so that like if I wasn't sure I was like no just gonna over here you're not gonna reject me I'm I'm fine by myself I was able to have one semi-stable relationship in high school I think the only reason though was because I had a really severe eating disorder which is sort of the way that I regulated my emotions at the time I did go to eating disorder treatment and after I got out, I was starting to feel my feelings. Great time to get into a really toxic on again, off again relationship, right? The other person was constantly leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. And like the first few times we'd only been dating for a short while. So it was really painful, but it wasn't unbearable. And then as time went on, it was like, every time the pain just compounded and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I started to act out in really problematic ways. I had one time I was driving way too fast because I was really emotional and I got in a really bad wreck. And when we were in an off phase, I used to run into that person by accident on purpose. There were times I would scream in the street in the middle of the night, hoping that the embarrassment that I caused would like get them to come out to deal with me. I sent them desperate email after email, ranging from topics like, I love you, please don't leave me, to you are a horrible psycho freak. And the worst thing that I think I've ever done to anyone was one of the last breakups we had, they said they didn't love me anymore. And I lost it. I self harmed and I made a video of it. And in the video, I said, this is all your fault. If something happens to me, it's on you. And I sent it to them. And all of that stuff sounds really horrible, which it is. Um, it is definitely the stuff that I regret the most doing in my life. I think one of the things that fills me with the most shame is realizing that I was really preying on the other person's sense of guilt. I think if there's one thing I'd want people to understand about me at that time was that I was in so much emotional pain that I really didn't understand what I was doing to other people, which doesn't make the behavior okay at all. I guess I just sit here and I go, you know, imagine feeling the worst grief you've ever felt or if you've ever broken a bone and just feeling like that all the time when you're in really, really intense pain, it's kind of all consuming. And it's not that I wouldn't have wanted to be better for other people if I could see outside of that pain, but the pain was all that I saw. And I was so terrified of, of, of being alone with that pain that I just did anything and everything that I could to make that pain go away. So anyway, that's what, I think that was what that symptom was really like for me. What about the rest of y'all? What was the symptom like for you? I feel like, I feel like I need to take a second to like, like also absorb what, what Zanny just said. Take a breath 
and step back at any time because that's some heavy stuff. And I think we could probably, like, we're all like nodding along. I think we could probably all relate to something that you just said, Zanny. I was literally sat here. Did you see? I was almost like trying to fix some position, thinking somebody's been watching my life story. Um, I went, I went through um, a point that I didn't know that I had BPD, and it's only looking back that I recognised some of the the symptoms, especially when it came to relationships. I I moved to the UK at a very young age and had to leave family members behind. And then I, I moved around a few times in, in my younger life. I went through um, the, care, the social service care system and things like that. So by the time I was in the process of starting to date people, I was already a little bit compromised in what I could accept in the relationship, which often meant I would make compromises, severe compromises. Okay, so you, you can only see me once a week. Okay, that'll do. Literally begging, I remember begging someone, please just come and see me. We don't even have to have sex. You could just hold me and then go. Like, or you could just have sex and then go home. I don't even mind as long as I see you. I, I went, it was very much that kind of stuff. I think it was the thing of the, the people pleasing aspect of it was, please don't go, I'll do anything. And then the rage would come in. And I'd be like, you, beep, 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 not having it. I remember storming around someone's house one night and banging on the door at uh, midnight because I was convinced there was someone else there because they didn't want to see me. I was like, there must be someone in here. I remember literally checking every room. The people pleasing is can be kind of a double-edged sword where on the one hand, you're like, I'll do anything. And then people take advantage of that. And then you feel betrayed that they took advantage of that in a way. It's like, I... I was doing all of this to try to get you to like me. And what you showed me is this like dark person that's going to like take advantage of that. And then it's like, well, how dare you take advantage of me? You know, like <laughs> that's just what I was thinking about when you were talking. And then you can kind of uh, internalize because that's what happened to me. And, and instead of being like, OK, and getting angry about the fact that I was getting used, I ended up pretty much brainwashing myself into saying you are just a tool on this earth and you basically have to help these guys get to their dream so basically i was so scared of abandonment that i chose two roads one i'll be the asshole so i'll cheat on you before you cheat on me i'll fuck things up before you fuck things up and two um all right so this is the plan you're here what is your dream i'll help you get there you'll leave because you're gonna leave me regardless no matter what so i'll just help you get there and then see you later you know so every time they felt like i felt like well i'm just getting used i would say all right because i'm i'm a tool so i'm getting used because that's what i'm here to do which is just very very strange that's funny hearing that um, from a, from um, a different gender perspective because I that scared me just now because I had the very same notion and I actually had a conversation with an ex partner recently and they said you told me that you couldn't feel love because that was my way of pushing them away before they pushed me away so I had that same thing of well I'll help them do this I remember going to one girl's house oh I'll fix your garden for you I'll do this and I'll be off because it will help you start your business and you know crazy things yeah there's so many times that I have gone above and beyond for people that did not deserve any of that from me and it was really just to kind of show, not even just to show them, like, I do feel like I am a person that can give to people selflessly, but I always did feel like there maybe might have been something in the back of my mind that is like, if I do all of this for that person, then they're going to need me. Like, if if we end, if things end, like they're going to need me even more. They're going to be like, damn it. I really want this person to come do my dishes or like clean up my apartment or like little dumb things. But like really just putting yourself out there to feel like you want to feel needed so badly and like kind of going above and beyond for people who are not going to do the same things for you at all, which is just like, it is, it's self-sabotage in so many ways. All the stories that were sharing as well i mean it just shows how all of this has to do with with such a like sense of really really low self-worth right and i think it took a really long time for me to tap into that like am i you know am i deserving of actually being with somebody everybody just leaves me everybody wants to leave and that definitely for me anyway stems from like childhood abandonment um kind of having a lot of people in and out of my household as a kid different caregivers 
Um, I mean, I had some stability, but there was also like quite a bit of chaos. All the examples I'm hearing here are all things that I've experienced as well, right? And it's like such a deep, deep sense of desperation. Danny, you had mentioned like um, just the pain of it, right? That's probably one of the most defining things of BPD is a really intense, all-consuming emotional pain. I also ended up getting into relationships, mostly with people who were like quite abusive towards me, quite emotionally abusive, and would do things like block me or shut me out or not talk to me for days as, as like a punishment. My exes were not very good people to me anyway, right? Not people I wanted in my life anyway, now that I look back on it. Um, but I needed to prove that I could, that I was worth something, that I could hold on to them, that I could be in that relationship, I guess. And if anything occurred to threaten that, that like perceived fear of abandonment, I thought I was going to die. Like I literally thought I was going to die. I felt like I would be dead in an hour and I would do absolutely anything to stop it. You know, I've never taken videos or pictures of self-harm, but I've sent long, long text messages, right? Put this all in an email, communicated this um, in a whole bunch of different ways. And it was like the idea of, if you can just see the intensity of what I'm going through, maybe you'll help me. Maybe I can feel loved. But of course, you know, that kind of behavior pushes people away. But it was like a lack of awareness that this is what was going on. I didn't get a BPD diagnosis until I was older either. I was like 27. Um, and when I heard fear of abandonment, everything started clicking. Um, so, yeah, that's... Thank you guys all for sharing because I relate to absolutely everything you're saying. I have chills after what you just said. That's a great point, Jess, and how you mentioned about just that level of desperation. I think it was always that level of desperation. I also didn't send um, videos or pictures, but I did do things that were just very horrible at that moment. So I specifically remember one time where I was dating someone and I always tended to go back to this original first relationship, right? Like it was always like a safe haven. He was older than me. It was my first boyfriend, it just made sense. And I remember I had a fight with my current boyfriend and I ended up luring this fight about like one doorway away from my ex-boyfriend's house on purpose. And my new boyfriend was just screaming at me. And I was like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't take it, even though I had hurt him. My boyfriend was an artisan and I have a necklace on and he walks away. He's like, that's it. I'm just going to leave you here. He turns around and I go, oh, he's going to come back to help me. Right? No, he comes back and just takes off the necklace I have on because he had made it, takes it with him. And at that moment I started screaming like screaming at the top of my lungs just so that my ex-boyfriend would hear and then he came out. And it's this again kind of victimization even though in my head I knew that I kind of started all of this. But at that moment, back to what Jess had said, it's a level of desperation. And like Zanny said, a level of pain that you feel like you're going to die. It's, it's incredible hearing everyone else share because you feel less alone and you go oh my gosh like you know it i i don't think i've ever had conversations like this with other people so thanks again everyone for sharing i've talked to a lot of people in the field who actually disagree with the fact that it's like abandonment that we fear because if we think about what abandonment means it's like it, that's not like someone's like leaving us in the desert to like to like to survive on our own like it's someone's leaving us in our lives the word abandonment can feel a little dramatic sometimes but it is dramatic because of the way that our feelings are and that's why i think also the symptom in itself is not just fear of abandonment because as humans we kind of all fear like people in our lives leaving us but it's like these frantic efforts to avoid this abandonment it's all of that emotions that come underneath it and it's something i actually really haven't thought about in a long time but hearing your stories it really is like i can't even describe to someone like that desperation whenever i talk about it i notice i'm like grabbing out for something like i'm always going like this because that's what it always felt like in the moment it felt like if i'm having a fight with someone i'm like i'm on the floor i'm crying i'm screaming i'm begging on my knees like please don't leave me please because if you leave me then I'm left here by myself. What goes all underneath this is the fact that a lot of us don't have the sense of who we are outside of these strong relationships that we build and our and our like our self-worth is based on these people, based on these relationships. So if you leave me, that means I'm completely worthless. I'm never going to hear from you ever again, too. It's a lot of that black and white thinking also that comes in. It's like 
it's normal for people to get into fights. It's normal for people to walk out. And that's something that I think that we learn through treatment and stuff that it's okay. You can, it's actually really good for people to walk out and take time. So like, you're not just screaming at each other. Um, but back then it kind of felt like when they're walking out the door, I'm never going to see them again. And that means I'm worthless and I'm always going to be worthless. And I'm never going to be able to recover from this. If people who don't have BPD, like don't understand, they can try to think about that way. Like not knowing who you are, feeling totally worthless. If someone walks out, then maybe you can like understand really like why we do these things that we regret and we feel so shameful about because of this pain that just completely takes over our minds at those moments. Yeah, I can like crazy relate, definitely put a lot of my identity in other people. So I, I feel that so strongly. Um, and you're talking about the fear of abandonment and ha people having sort of issues with that term. I think one of the things that's helped me is I characterize it more as a, a general fear of loss. And I, I'm again, like that's a normal human thing, right? But like I, one of the struggles that I had that has always been kind of difficult to, describe as like I had this fear of time in a way because time was going to rob me of everyone that I love. I did not want to grow up. I think I acted very childlike, not like consciously on purpose, but in a way still on purpose. I had this ridiculous thought. If I don't grow up, if I still need my parents, they can't die. They can't die. I need them. They're, they can't go anywhere. I think that that sort of translated to all my relationships when things started to go bad. It was like, I'm going to fall apart because if I need them, they can't leave me. No person in their right mind would leave a helpless child, even though, of course, at that point, I'm an adult, right? So it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> but <laughs> do you know what? This is powerful and emotional stuff. And I grew up with this thing that I wasn't good enough. But I was around a lot of high achieving people. So I always thought I need to um do more be better and consequently when it came to relationships i literally would put up with anything because this person was so like awesome and amazing in my mind that i couldn't i couldn't let go of them and i, and I remember this person actually phoned me up from holiday a, a yoga retreat saying oh yeah i've been chatting to this guy what do you think and i was there giving dating advice to someone that i was seeing trying to be this open-minded person because I thought, well, I don't want to seem jealous because they're going to, they're going to run away. Every single time one of you guys talks, it's like, oh yeah, that, you know what I mean? You, you, it makes total sense. A little bit back to what Alex was saying and then connecting with what um, Papa Fergus was saying. Um, that moment when someone's trying to leave you and you're on your knees, like literally begging. And it was very strange because it was obviously that fear of losing that person, like Alex said, maybe not knowing if I'm ever going to see them again, but also in my mind, weirdly enough, because I think a little bit of like narcissism has been something that has been a part of me as well, was like, no, 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 you're broken and I'm the only one that can fix you. So if you leave, I'm not going to be done fixing. And because of that, usually all my relationships were very abusive because I would be like, I can take that abuse. I've screamed at people. I've hit people. I've thrown things at people. So if they scream at me and they throw things at me, it's okay because I can handle it and I can fix it even though I was not there myself to be helping absolutely anyone. Uh, but you kind of think about it that way and you go, if they leave the, that door, um, they're also never going to be fixed. So, and it's weird because now you're viewing people as projects and that's something I did a lot. I viewed them as projects and I assumed they viewed me the same way because I was a mess. You know, so it's it's very difficult to uh, to figure those feelings out. But thanks for bringing all that up, guys. I'm also thinking about I've gotten really good at nurturing and fostering friendships and relationships. And I choose healthy friends now. When it comes to personal relationships, like romantic relationships, Papa, what you were saying about not feeling good enough. You know, if I encounter somebody who's healthy, emotional, mentally healthy, that scares the shit out of me sometimes. Like I'm ready for it, but it's really, really scary. And part of the reason why it's scary, it's because they're healthy enough to leave me early on if they spot a red flag, right? Or, you know, the fear of like, maybe I, I'm still not good enough despite all the work that I've been doing. But cognitively, I know that I am. You know, I'm kind of on this like ride of just staying single right now. I'm still attracted to trauma. I'm still attracted to individuals who've got tons and tons of deep-seated, unhealed trauma. But 
I'm strong enough in myself now that I can have empathy and boundaries with that individual, right? I'm not going to go too far. I can walk away from them now, right? So it's this weird in-between place. And something that I'm thinking about a lot lately is like recovery, right? What does it mean to be in recovery from this symptom in particular? It's a lifelong process, I'm sure. But I was wondering, like, I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to any changes or how they've like noticed themselves, like change for the better, maybe. I can definitely speak to that. So I feel like I am in a point of my, in my recovery where I do, I have started to like use the terminology, like I used to have BPD because I really don't identify with the symptoms anymore. Um, and I feel very grateful for that. Um, I just came out of a three and a half year, like extremely toxic relationship, it, exactly kind of what your relationships have been like, just like, I also like to take on people who need my help, who are, have tons of trauma on their own, tons of their own issues. And maybe a lot of times I've been in relationships with people that I'm like, I don't really know if I even want to be with this person, but no matter what, when it ended, it was horrible. Um, after my most recent breakup, we really did have a deep love and respect for each other. and. Um, I think I was just at that point finally in my recovery where I was just able to know like this person just isn't good for me. Like I could finally see reality as it was. And I think that a huge part of getting to that point in my recovery is the fact that I have been building up my own self-worth and identity over the past years. I finally know who I am and I know that I have a worth and I can give something to this world. And I know that like, I really do know that eventually when I do find someone that I end up with that they're gonna be lucky to have me because I am such a caring and loving and like, I can totally understand like how horrible it must be to be a partner with someone who is like really going through and really fearing the abandonment. But once we can reach a point of where we have our own identity and our, our own meaning in this world, like we, I feel like people should be, feel lucky to be with us because we love so hard. We're so emotional. We're so caring and giving. And I'm like feeling like I know who I am now. I When I go on dates, I actually really do notice a lot of red flags when it's like, you know, if there's anyone who needs fixing, now I'm like, Thank you, but no. I'm also a therapist, so I'm like, I don't need to do any fixing in my other relationships. So um, I've been really good at like not falling into patterns like that anymore. And um, also like just being able to walk away from things and feeling like that person did really love me. Even if it didn't end well, that person did love me and care for me. And I still have so much self-worth and it's taken a long time to get here, but it's possible. And I think that's why we're doing this to show you like everyone who's watching this, that it is possible to get to that point and feel like secure and worth it. No matter like, no matter how another person tries to make you feel, feel, or doesn't even try, but how and like a end of a relationship makes you feel. So well put. Yeah. Thank you. My mind is spinning with beautiful wonderment and joy. I have the, some of the most amazing friends and they accepted me for who I am, which I never realized what a beautiful thing that is. People that would put up with your foolish ways or your childish ways and still come back and support you. The most important thing I realized was that as a consequence of, is of who I am as a person, because I'm the magnet that's attracted these people to me. And I never realized that for such a long time that these people aren't stupid, they're amazing. So obviously, if they choose to be my friends, they've made the, an, an informed decision. It's not just a random thing. And straight away, that helped improve my um, self-esteem. What I also did was I actually started following a lot of um, female empowerment pages and different things to educate myself on topics that ordinarily I wouldn't have come across, which is um, pretty much how I created my Instagram. And one of the things that I wrote, which sums it up, is a saying that I found. And it said, I'm working on myself because sometimes I'm the problem. And the day that I read that thing, I thought, bing, 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 that's how I'm going to approach life from now on. Because if I'm good now, when I'm getting a relationship, I want their friends to be jealous. Like, you know, as in, wow, this guy is... I can see why, you know, he, he's not as tall, he's not as this, he's not as that, but he's amazing. Well done, you. And that's how I've got to look at it. Love it. I love that. A way that I really was able to um, recover was using my career and my culture. And my career, I decided to be service-based because then I could really 
give that service and help people. So I became a nutritionist, a trainer, and a behavior change specialist. And I work in cultural diversity, especially in the Latinx community. So I feel like I'm giving back and therefore you don't have that need to constantly be fixing your romantic relationships, right? So that's a big one. And then culturally, as I grew up very close to my indigenous Mexican culture, but I kind of let it go. And I, I mean, I moved multiple places, lived in America, lived in Mexico. When I became very close to it, I realized, especially in our mezzo and pre-Hispanic uh, culture, we, we do come from warriors, but we come from healers. We come from a lot of different things. And, and I, I was able to deep dive into our beliefs and and really helped me set boundaries because that's what I struggle with the most is setting boundaries. And once I mix those two things together and again, work a lot at it, even as a behavior change specialist, I constantly worked on my behavior. I wrote my mood down. I wrote how I felt. I wrote bad days. I wrote good days. So it takes a lot of work, but I do want to tell people out there, it is a hundred percent possible. I am so happy. I am so excited with my life. I, yeah, is there bad days for sure? But then, like I said, I, I take a moment, I breathe and I see the roads ahead of me and I make a better decision. hundred percent possible to live a very good life. It's going to take work. But if, if I can do it, if we can do it, anyone out there listening can do it too. Oh man, what you said about boundaries, that was such a big one for me. First of all, it wasn't just that I didn't enforce my boundaries. I didn't really have any. And when I didn't have any boundaries, people were like, cool, well, I guess anything goes. I think one of the things that helped me a lot was realizing what I am actually comfortable with and being willing to tell people, no, this is too far, instead of finding out after the fact what my boundaries were and then being angry that people didn't automatically know something that I hadn't told them. Um, one of the things that Alex said earlier, I think about people being lucky to be with, you know, those of us who feel really deeply reminds me of when my husband was, um, you know, in the earlier dating stages, he had a conversation with my dad and my dad said, you know, that being with me was going to be, you know, very up and down, but that he, my husband, wouldn't meet a more loyal, loving person anywhere. I'm not going to say that like those are BPD traits. They're not, but I do think that most of us have this inherent emotion sensitivity and um, that is not a bad thing. I think the only other things that I would say, you know, since I do want to make sure I cover, like, how did I get to be married and have, like, a long-term relationship? I think one of the really important things was I stopped falling in love with the idea of a person. And I stopped trying to force other people to be my idea. Like, there were a lot of times where I had to realize who my husband is. It's not like I like every single thing about him. And, you know, there were moments where I had to be like, okay... Well, is this something that I can accept and find a way to love, even though it's not like my perfect person? Because, of course, no such perfect person exists. I have to remind myself of that a lot still to this day. You know, sometimes he'll say something kind of snappy and I, I have to remind myself that he doesn't mean it in the way that I'm taking it or you know, just ask him. That's a really, really big one. Ask people what their intentions are. What do you mean by that? Um, and not just assuming that I know what he means. There's one thing I used to call my dad all the time. And I was like, my husband, my, or at the time, my boyfriend, blah, 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 blah. And my dad would say, okay, Zanny, has he ever tried to do something to hurt your feelings on purpose? And I would sit there and I'd be like, no. And he's like, okay, so what's the likelihood that he's doing it right now? And we're very science-minded. So I was like, statistically zero. And he was like, okay, so what are some other explanations for what's going on? And then, you know, then I'd go through that. So broadly speaking, it's taking a step back from the emotion and being like, okay, what's the greater picture here? Am I really being abandoned? Am I really being attacked? And if the answer is yes, you know, then that's a whole other story. But for me, especially now that I do a better job of surrounding myself with good people, it's almost never true that they're abandoning me or actually trying to hurt me. It's usually some interpretation I have of what's going on. 
I'm so glad that you just kind of ran through your little check the facts process there because it is so important to do that. And like when, I mean, not everyone is going to go through DBT and be able to get that kind of training. But um, for me, it was like, it's very manualized. It's very like you learn in like how to do it step by step. And it might seem like silly and menial in the moment. And it might seem like something like, I don't want to, I'm not going to put this effort every time something happens. It's not even something I consciously do anymore, but if I feel like someone is being maybe a little cold with me, a little harsh, I'm able to immediately be like, okay, what what am I perceiving? What is actually going on? And what am I making up in my mind that's happening now? And I kind of am at the point where I'm not even like, I try to not even think at all what, what is going on in someone's mind unless they tell me. So it definitely take, it takes work to get to that point, but it's so doable. And then I just want to go back to the boundaries thing again, because I'm so happy that our conversation has ended up here um, because hearing all of our stories and hearing a lot of people with BPD stories, like we, a lot of us, we lack boundaries. And I remember being in therapy at one point being like, I don't know what a boundary is. I don't understand. What does this even mean? Like, what is a boundary? It also stems from this, again, like this feeling of like not knowing who we are. Cause if we don't know what we're willing to tolerate in a relationship or like what we're willing to allow other people to do to us or take advantage of us, like, we can't have these boundaries. That identity piece is so important to work on. And that's not even necessarily a big part of like DBT or anything like that. But um, working on your identity, like aside from that is just so important. Finding other important things in your life that make you a person on your own and worth something on your own. That allows you to be like, hey, that is not cool that that person just did that to me and I don't deserve to be treated like that. And once you get that mindset, then you can start putting up boundaries. I finally know what boundaries are. And since I have started exerting them in my relationships, it's not easy. It feels uncomfortable sometimes. Like I feel bad exerting boundaries, but it's normal. People do it all the time. Like you're supposed to exert boundaries. So I'm still getting used to that, but it's like, I feel so much more respect for myself. I'm like, they are not going to hurt me. Like I am worth something. I am actually where I feel like I am worth a lot more than I have let on my whole life, like, or believed my whole life. So it's like, it's exciting to get to that point. It's a, it could be a shit road to get here, but it's, you know, it feels good to be here and finally feel like I can put up boundaries in my life. I was going to add just that kind of all consuming pain we talked about of feeling like you're going to die. A turning point for me was just realizing that it's not going to kill me. I'm not going to die. I'm, I'm, I'm here. It's okay. Right. I'm going to survive that. That realization of like, you know what? This pain is tolerable. Every time I tolerated it, it got easier and easier to tolerate. Right. The pain, the issue, the dilemma, the crisis over the years got more and more in perspective, right? That intense fear of abandonment was now backed up with a whole bunch of like context and, you know, thinking clearly and checking the facts and understanding the other person, understanding myself, right? My own sense of identity strengthening and around like the boundaries thing, you know, for me, yeah, there was definitely a lack of boundaries with other people. But I also just had a lack of intention with myself, right? I had a, like, a lack of boundaries with myself. And I think a lot of this overcoming, and it's not something that I really, it's just something that, you know, one day I realized like, oh, I have choice. I don't have to sit here screaming desperately. I don't have to do that. There's other options. And that sounds so silly, but it's just, especially if your coping mechanisms are being reinforced or if your coping mechanisms are tucked away in private and nobody ever sees them except for your partner or something. You don't really get exposed to what your other options are. Having these conversations, like luckily I did DBT and just take going step by step of like, you know what? You can actually check the facts. Here's how you do it. One, two, three, four. It's skill sets that other people maybe tend to have or, you know, learn somewhere along the way. And I just didn't, I just didn't know those things. It never clicked. It didn't seem like a possibility. So just that realization of like, okay, actually I am strong. I can take care of myself. I can, I don't have to go blackout drinking. I can choose to say no right now and then walk in this direction. Or, you know, that, that was huge, huge, huge in me being able to deal with, you know, this, like these frantic efforts to avoid abandonment. I can choose not to be frantic, 
right? And, and I never thought that was possible before. I thought I would just eventually kill myself. So that realization, like that really saved my life. So yeah, for everybody watching, you can choose something else. You can be something else. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do. That's, that's beautiful. Um, for me, it was being taught from a young age that things like family come first. Literally nothing comes before the family. And I, I've had to extricate myself from a few close family type situations, which hurt my actual heart. I mean, I cried about this. I'm going to say this on camera. I cried about these situations, but I feel so much lighter because it allowed me to think, yes, I did it. I stood up for myself, even though, and the reason why that's so important, a lot of the things I've done in my life has been about protecting other people from harm. So imagine how crazy that was to not be able to do it for yourself where you're, when everyone else, I'm like out there. And then when it was me, I'm like, meow, don't hurt me, please. If I could give you one thing, diversify your friend circle, because unfortunately, when you're in a certain place in life, you gravitate towards others of the same or lesser um, um, attitude. So if you're feeling quite down, your friends are probably going to become that type of people. Diversify your friend circle and you're much more likely to break free of the, um, the, the, the stalemate in, in your life. Absolutely, I could not agree more. And another thing that helped me was the term leading by example. And the reason I say that is because boundaries for sure, hardest thing ever. I did also did not know what that was because I was the cool one. The cool one doesn't have boundaries. You wanna scream at me, scream at me. You wanna yell at me, yell at me. I'm the cool one. I have zero boundaries, everything goes. And I started realizing that as I became a coach and was trying to help other people with their, even something like their nutrition, I would be like, okay, we start, we have to start setting boundaries. And I'd go back and be like, oh my gosh, yeah, all of these things are important. How can I tell someone to do it if I'm not doing it myself, right? So that kind of mindset of leading by example, I'm going to need to start placing these boundaries so that I can also know what it feels like. And I, I love to hear that a lot of us um, had an experience with DBT because I think that's what helped me a lot as well. And it's just all those steps that you need. And once that started to happen, everything started to click, but it was really hard to let go and set boundaries because again, you go back to this, creation whether you create you know about someone or yourself i was the cool one how can i have boundaries i'm the one that anyone can come to with zero boundaries but it doesn't work that way we all have to have it and what papa said about family same thing it includes your family it, it the number one thing is you if you don't love yourself if you don't know your worth you can't really share that with anyone else so boundaries are so important but i don't want to minimize how difficult it is if that's something that was not a part of your life it is to me was honestly the hardest thing to actually put up and i still struggle with it you know it still it still comes and goes so a hundred percent and again i know i keep saying the same thing but amazing to hear this because you guys talk and i go oh my gosh like a hundred percent so it's it's such a great it's such a this is such a great thing to do and be able to share and i hope people out there that are listening also feel that connection and know that they're not alone either i love that if there's anything that i want to impart on those of you who are really struggling is that you know getting beyond this is possible and it takes a lot of time. And I think it's very important to recognize that, like, if you've been a certain way for a really long time, it's not like you can just wake up and overwrite all of those circuits. Our brains want to try to autonomize as many processes as possible because the more conscious effort something takes, the more work it is. So a lot of the things that we do, these problematic behaviors, have become automatic by doing them over and over and over again. So when you change that, that takes conscious effort to override it and then, and eventually you can. But I remember trying to work so hard. Every few months I was able to do a little bit more and after about 18 months, about two years of consistently working on it, I, I'm very treatment resistant. I, I was like, no, 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 no. So yeah, I know some people who've overcome a lot of this faster than that, but I don't think two years is like that unreasonable. But after about two years, I was able to, on average, not have a big problematic lash out. 
So, you know, it takes time. And if it takes you a long time, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you if it takes time. Um, and I just hope that, you know, if you're in that slog, it will pay off. Just don't give up on yourself. I think that something that is like blows my mind a little bit is that we engage in these behaviors that are so unhealthy, not just for ourselves, but for the other person that's involved in this situation. These frantic efforts, whether it's sending someone 50 texts in a row or self-harming or showing up at someone's house, you know, like all these things we've talked about, no matter what it is, it's when we're blind to this and we don't really know what's going on with ourselves we don't really realize like these behaviors, they're not, they're not even like reinforced in a way that we're really usually getting what we want. Like sometimes, yes, we can hold on to a partner for a little bit longer, um, you know, keep them in our lives a little bit longer, but it's not even in like a fulfilling way. So something that I would also like, it can be a good first step because a lot of the things we might be talking about might seem a little bit overwhelming because it does take time to get there. But a first step could be just being mindful of how these things really affect you. When you're acting frantically towards someone else, how does it affect you and how does it affect them? And do you really want to be like living with things like this? It's part of your self-respect. Like in DBT, you talk about self-respect goals. Like is what you're doing in line with your own self-respect? Is it also in, in line with how you want to be treating other people and the way that you want to impact other people's lives? I know that looking back, I do feel a lot of shame and even guilty about um, some of the things I've done that must have been really painful for other people to witness. It's just a really good first step is just to like take a minute and think like, how do I feel after these moments where I'm frantic and trying to avoid abandonment? And how does this other person feel? And moving forward, like then you can kind of start figuring out what you want to do to help implement like all these different treatments or whatever you can do to stop those things. On my page, I get so many messages of people just being like, when, when am I going to be better? When am I going to, how long is this going to take? Okay, I've got the diagnosis now. What, what now, right? And it's been four years since my diagnosis. And I was really lucky enough to get into an inpatient place like right away for a little bit into DBT within the year. I was fortunate that I was able to um, go on sick leave for a while. I was able to step away and really de-stress my life so that I could purely focus on this, right? And then even then it still took me like two years to get to a point where I wasn't blowing up, right? Um, where I had the awareness and, and the skills to separate myself, like truly separate myself, like, you know, leave the relationships that were triggering that, that weren't healthy. But I still didn't necessarily know what to do about it. That took like a whole other year to really reflect and, and be like, it's how I am in my personal relationships. Is that reflective of who I want to be out in the world generally? The answer was no, right? So I needed to think about that and adjust that. And then, you know, another year later and I'm still, you know, it's still a process. I'm still getting there. I definitely have a lot more intention now, but it takes time. So be patient, right? Be patient. Don't be waiting for change to happen. Just 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 do do change a little bit every day. Practice doing new things. Like Zanny said, like you kind of develop negative habits by that repetition throughout your entire life. It's gonna take a long time, a lot of repetition of trying new habits for like those new habits to emerge. Believe that you can do it. Diversify. I think that was so important when you said diversify your friend group. Um, because there's so much out there that you do not know, right? On how to be, how to behave, how to act, how to think, how to feel. Um, learn from as many different people who are in, in many different stages of life that are different from you. That is so, so, so helpful. Having BBD, you're kind of, you're thrown into a minefield. Then you start educating, getting some awareness, and then you're able to like negotiate this minefield a little bit more. But then wait a few more years, keep practicing, and you'll actually be able to like diffuse. Right? You'll be able to identify and diffuse where all the bombs are. Um, and that is so empowering. I'm so thankful for all of you guys saying these things out loud. To somebody, you're having somebody else like tell a story and you're like, oh my God, I did that really crazy shit too. Like that <laughs> is, is really, really um, validating. Absolutely. Yes, a hundred percent. I like, I feel so much joy right now. Something that I uh, tell a lot of my clients and my followers is change is a process. It's not an event. So it's definitely not going to 
happen today. Uh, tiny little steps are what is important. We want instant gratification, but we can't have it with this. We really have to take our time. And something that is also very important when it comes to self-worth is knowing that your worth isn't based on someone else. So if you're out there trying to change, please don't place your worth on your relationship or your partner or anybody else because it's going to be difficult. You have to love yourself. You have to work on yourself every single day. And it is a process. I was diagnosed 15 years ago and I stopped self-harming eight years ago and even then like I said now even as a professional I still have some struggles here and there with boundaries or sometimes uh, like Zanny said sometimes you'll say something snappy and and you really it's not as often anymore that you do something as extreme but we still have to calibrate and also we realize back to what Alex said about really being awesome as people. We really are. My mom always said, all these things that you struggle with might eventually turn into superpowers if you train them. And it really was about that. It was about training these, these maybe problems at the time that became skills. Cause now I use these same emotions to help other people to reach my goals, to, to start businesses, to do whatever I need to do. So anyone out there, you really can train those superpowers anytime if you've seen superheroes movies no one knows what to do with it it's a curse more than a blessing it takes time train take your time you're gonna be amazing yes yes love that <laughs> i wanted to clap then i almost clapped almost like can i just say something that came to my mind very quickly earlier on we were saying why it's so difficult to leave leave relationships and for me personally a lot of relationships were about winning they weren't really about my involvement with the other person. It was like, I can't leave it like this. I have to win this situation. Otherwise, I'm going to be the, no, no, not having it. That was one thing. On the subject of self-esteem, um, what I learned was there's a big difference between being of service and being a servant. Um, and it's about trying to separate those two. So it's not a problem to do these things for the people. The problem is, is when you're not being um, specific in your intention and, and your expectations from the situation. If you lend someone money and you know they can't pay it back, don't expect them to pay it back. Be grateful if they do. But And it's the same with the thing. If you love someone and you know they might not give it back, don't expect it. If they do, it's a wonderful bonus. If not, you're, you, you, you're not hurt by the lack of you getting what you want in return. And again, it goes back to the winning thing. My therapist used to tell me like all the time, he's like, is this a game? Like, do you, like, like there's no winning or losing in a relationship. But I'm like, no, but like, I don't, I can't lose. I can't be like, I can't be like at the bottom at this, you know, like I can't come out like the loser. It's funny that you, you say that because one of the pieces of advice that my dad has given me, you don't want to win against your partner. Why would you want to make your partner a loser? Then you're with a loser. It wanted to be a partnership. If you put someone down, then you're going to start to think all kinds of negative things about them that are not not good for you. And the superhero thing, I think maybe it's the emotional sensitivity aspect. It's not BPD is a superpower, but but the that emotional sensitivity, we can either let it corrupt us or, you know, we can use it to love deeply you know, live boldly, do things with passion, be very empathetic. You know, this group of people, I'm blown away by the amount of time and energy that all of you put into this. You know, the, I thought I was going to have to do everything myself and like Alex designed our logo. You know, we have somebody else writing our theme song. It's like everyone is so generous and kind and loving. And I think you know, that's the thing that if you're really struggling right now, that's the version of you that you can look forward to in the future when you overcome what you're going through right now. I just wanted to say one thing that I just kind of keep thinking, but because I, and you know, maybe you guys get similar messages from people, but people feel, people are and feel really disabled by BPD, right? And, and the symptoms. We actually have such intense capacity. We have probably way higher capacity than a lot of other people because gone through and survived like really intense, intense pain you know, getting through those things, if you are able to harness it, like, you know, your capacity is so much higher than you ever, than you could ever have like imagined, which is, is weird because we do get so down on ourselves and have such low self-worth, but like we've survived so, 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 so much. 
right? It really is. It really is a superpower. And yeah, just harnessing it. Harnessing it is is what's really important. Thank you, everybody, for watching. That was our very first episode of the VPD Bunch. Next week, we'll be back talking about the symptom unstable relationship. So tune in for that. If you like what you see, like this video, subscribe and hit the bell to turn on your notifications so that you see the next episode when it comes out. Till next time. Bye. Wait, wait, wait. One more thing. I have a surprise for you and that is da 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 da. We will not be uploading once, but twice a week to our channel because we created a special bonus series. It's called the BPD Bunch Brunch, where we get together with our favorite brunchy beverages to catch up, play games, and talk about all things BPD. So our main series will upload on Wednesdays and our brunch series will upload on Saturdays. For our first season, our brunch series is going to complement our main episodes, but in future seasons, we're gonna open it up to Q and A's, guest spots, all that good stuff. There's just way too many fun things to do in life. Anyway, we'll see you on Saturday for brunch and our next main episode on unstable relationships will be out next Wednesday. We'll see you then.